everybody, welcome to another IAIB Spotlight. This week, uh, we are uh, putting the spotlight on uh, someone actually that I really admire in the business. And when I first started off getting into podcasting, uh, one of the first podcasts that I found was uh, Red Bar Radio. Uh, we have Mike David on from Red Bar Radio to talk about uh, what he's been up to and uh, where internet broadcasting is going. How you doing, Mike? Thanks for having me, Andrew. I'm doing splendid this morning. Uh, I see the Candyman hat on already. Uh, yeah, I um very yeah, inside Candyman. baseball. Very inside baseball with that term, right? Yeah, Candyman, of course, is the black African American villain from the Candyman movies. He is the big guy with the hook. You say his name five times in the mirror. And he comes and kills you with his army of bees. The bees are very dangerous. The bees are dangerous. His hook is dangerous. You know, he's dangerous without the powers, you know. You know, people so, have been saying that the bees are disappearing. They just have to look into his mouth. Yeah, the bees <laughs> are. Yeah, yeah. They're in his mouth. That's where all the bees are going. They're swarming to him. Yeah, we have to save the bees. And apparently he's just eating them. But uh, we'll get back to the Candyman stuff and we'll get back to bees. Uh, our show sponsored by bees.com. Lovebees.com. Yeah. So, Mike, I want I want to go through your entire broadcasting career because it's it's very oh. interesting. People do say that I am the the villain version of you, uh, with yeah, my looks swarthy wise, looks. You know, when I'm not wearing my hat, we kind of have some similar features here with the dark features and stuff. We're very swarthy, Mike. And a lot of people say you're the alternate evil looking version of me. And and I'll I'll, I'll accept that. I'm fine with that actually. I the think that is a compliment. version, like you said. Yeah. Um. How did you get into this? Because you started off before, I guess, the term podcasting started, right? Before everybody was doing iTunes and everybody was doing, you know, a podcast. You kind of were one of the first people to get into this as far as the comedy front goes. Yeah, back in around 2002, 2003, we started dabbling in this, what we were just calling internet radio, which I guess you could still call it now, right? Uh, yeah, internet broadcasting. I mean, I'm, I'm big internet on the whole term of that. Yeah. Because it's not radio anymore. No, it's, I mean... It never has been. No. Uh, okay. So we started goofing around with microphones. We were like uh, audio video guys, you know. And we were just goofing around with microphones uh, doing some recordings. And my buddy and I had our headphones on and we were both sitting in a room and we were talking to microphones. We go, oh my God, this sounds like a radio show. So we started um, just talking to each other and recording it. And all of a sudden, that conversation turned into a half-hour mock fake radio thing. And we put it up online. We put it up on Facebook. No, Facebook didn't exist. We put it, uh, we had this little website for our company, for our video production company. We put it up on there as like a welcome, a welcome MP3 message. Okay. So you would go on the site and they would just start playing <laughs> two maniacs talking. Talking about, about just radio stuff. It wasn't even like we were like, hey, welcome to our site today. Uh, the weather is uh, 72 degrees here in Chicago. How's the traffic, Ron? Well, that's exactly what it was. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, hysterical. We were just kidding, you know, yeah. and then we just started doing more of them because it was fun. And then uh, somehow it turned into a real show with an audience. Were you a fan of radio going into it? I was. And that's kind of why we we started doing it. Like I said, it, it accidentally happened from us just goofing around in front of microphones. Um, but uh, yeah, we would listen to the local radio here in Chicago, all the all the classics. So you had Man Cow and you had uh, you had at the time you had Steve Dahl, who was Steve big Dahl, in yeah. Chicago, Man Cow. Uh, and none of these people I respect, by the way, I want to make that perfectly clear. I think these are pigs. Uh, you had the cow. You had, uh, I think they were syndicating Stern a little bit later. You had, uh, then Opie and Anthony came came around. And uh, Opie and Anthony is the one terrestrial radio show that I do respect and, okay. and like. Well, it, it, it's, been a, it's been an interesting transition even for these guys because you're not, you know, when you're in a car and you're driving, you, you kind of were, were stuck to watching or listening to them, I should say. Now you have different options. I mean, you don't, with syndication happening and, and MP3s and podcasts and now Ford, you know, Ford is equipped in their car with internet radio. More and more people will find shows like yours to kind of compete with them. These antenna queens, as I like to call them from back in the day, really did win the lottery because they had an opportunity to be on one of the five talk stations in your yeah. city. And when you were in your car, you had nothing else to do besides listen to music on a tape 
or tune in in one of these talk shows. So the odds of them having a giant listener base were, were very easy. to Also, to re- and, and we should say, and I think you, we've spoken about this in the past, and I've said it on my other shows, uh, the way that the ratings were calculated was really corrupt. And it was. And it, it wasn't. It wasn't real. It wasn't real. It, it was. It was. It pretty much came to you getting a book and you writing down what you listened to in a book. And a lot of times, stations would find out who got a book, and they would pay them to write that they're yeah. listening to a certain show. When People Meter came in, all these shows, their ratings took a big plummet. I mean, it just crashed. Sure, and the People Meter is this thing where it, it started listening like Shazam does on your iPhone or Android device. It would start listening to what you're listening to and then send it to the uh, cloud, right? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of these radio shows, you know, so you grew up listening to them. You never really admired a lot of them. Opie and Anthony, you liked. Uh, you admired yeah, them. and I didn't start listening to that until way later. But we didn't have that in Chicago. But, um, you know, when I say listening to radio, I was never a fan. But again, when I was on these long drives to work and stuff, it was just on. And all of a sudden that became a comfortable background noise to have, like I said, never a fan of these people, but I did tune in every time I was in the car. What made you decide that this is something you're going to go into? Uh, I know you did the the mock show, but it had to have turned into a serious thing where you're going to do you know, a weekly or a daily show. What got me into doing it yeah. on a serious basis is the same thing that keeps me doing it now, and it's going to sound extremely cheesy. I don't even want it to come out of my mouth, but it's the listeners. So when we first did our fake little radio thing, the only reason we did another one is because somebody, whether it was a friend, a family member or whoever, they emailed us saying, this is funny. You should do another one. And once you get that taste of listener response, you can't you, you can't stop. You know, yeah. you, 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 there, there's no way to stop. If you've got five people telling you to do it again and that they're listening it's impossible to stop. And I think that's what kept us going in the beginning. So did you know anything about the technology that's involved with this? Because it's very different than it is now. I think it was a lot more complicated to kind of get your content out there, you know, in 2003. The only reason we ever had a chance back then is because we kind of knew about audio. So the fact that our fake little radio show sounded similar to a real radio show, audio wise, was the only reason people were listening. Uh, back then, you didn't have Guitar Center selling podcast kits. You couldn't go online and watch a YouTube demo on how to set up a podcast. You had to know how to hook up audio gear, how to get a website up, how to get you know music to play on your website. It, it was a very complicated process that took us, you know, uh, burning the midnight oil, sitting in front of the computer, you know, 24 hours at a time trying to figure this thing out. Nobody teaching us. Who knew? Did you know or or the person you had started the show kind of understood audio? I went to film school. Okay. And, you know, when you go to film school, you kind of learn your basic audio stuff. But we were into recording music and stuff back then. All right. So but I mean, it's kind of it's kind of the same thing with when it comes to, you know, you're recording audio in general. So you had a sure. good understanding of it. Uh, what kind of audio did you start off with? I know a lot of people probably are interested in, in what you started out with, you know, almost 11, 10 years ago. Like what kind of gear? Yeah. Very similar to what people are using today. Our, we had a Mackie 1402 mixer. Which I'm we, using right now. Which you're using right now. The same exact mixer you're using right now. You know, and, oh. bop, 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 my bad. Hold on. That is uh, very bad. You know what? I'll close that chat so it doesn't happen again. Um, you know what? You could go to the other stream. We have a, uh, if you click on like the JTV stream, that'll, that, that doesn't have ads. Yeah, I don't need to read it anyway. It's just a distraction. Um, but yeah, the same the same mix you're using now. And we were using some Rode condenser microphones and uh, a Behringer compressor. I mean, you start off with decent. I mean, that's decent audio. You didn't start off with, you know, one crappy USB mic and, and sitting in front of. They didn't have USB mics back. Then. They only yeah. had good audio. Equi- I mean, you couldn't buy crappy podcast equipment because yeah. it didn't exist. So you you only have the tools of the professional recording industry really to use. Yeah. You know. Uh, so you started off you you know you got the emails people telling you uh, I really like what you're doing. When do you make So how does that transition go to you know what maybe this is something that I want to do? This is what we did. And, and it is a long story. I'm trying to do the shortened quick fun version. It's uh we we have this production company website called Red Bar Productions. Okay. Okay. Where we did event videography and recordings. 
we, I don't think we had more than two clients ever. So eventually we started posting daily welcome messages to the site doing these mock little radio shows. Yeah. You know, and nobody was viewing this thing, but we would send it to friends. Like I said, we would we would send links to friends and they would enjoy it. You know, they would listen uh, to these little 20 minute fake broadcasts. And then we got the idea to just start doing it every day. And I think before we even had five fans, we were doing a daily one hour show. And we just kept putting them on the website and there was no archive. There was no podcast feed. It was just you would go to the website and it would start auto playing. Very annoying. Listen, it, it, it's it's a start. I think we all made that mistake at one point. Sure. As long as you didn't have like the dancing GIF Spider-Man in the corner. I think you're OK. We did have that. Oh, okay. I think we had a little radio uh, dial that moved, you know, like a little <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. animated dial. We thought that was so cool. <laughs> Lots of mistakes. And it doesn't sound, you know what I hate about the 2000s? Like when you say 2002, that doesn't sound like a long time ago. You no, know, it doesn't at all. But it is. I mean, technology wise, especially with what we're doing now, you know, you didn't have the luxury of flipping a camera and going on like Ustream or Stickham. None of those things technology were around. Wise, and I'm 29. So 10 years ago, I was a kid. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I started off a little later. Uh, I started in 2008. I started looking into it. And when I looked up comedy podcast, uh, you came up and I, I took a look. and I'm like, wow, you know what? This guy really is doing a great show with this. Uh, and it was rare even in 2008 to see someone other than like a Leo Laporte that's, you know, has has a, a radio gig and is able to fund it. There really wasn't anybody else that really had a big following when it came to podcasts. Uh, sure. And and one thing that I've always said is uh, it's amazing to see someone without a celebrity hood. Like they're not coming from television. They're not coming from radio. Just the yeah. guy that was successful with podcasting. I don't really see that that often. There's very few of us now, uh, you know, because there are some giant podcasts now. But they're celebrities. They've been celebrities. You know, yeah. Adam Carolla has been a celebrity for 20 years. For 20 years. Uh, Kevin Smith, another one. Uh, and then you have the comics that, you know, they, they do the show and they're really successful at it. But they have a tapped in audience. How did you attract the audience? It was all content. Did you do any kind of marketing or how did you get the awesome word question. out there? I have and still have have spent almost zero dollars on marketing. Uh, you know, all the money goes into the production value of the show and uh, paying the bills for the show. But the, the way we marketed at the beginning was very easy. We went on websites uh, that we liked and we said, hey, would you do a cross promotion with us? Would you link our site on your site? We'll talk about your site on our show and we'll do this for a week. We have nothing to lose. We'll each trade some viewers, some listeners. And we did this to thousands of websites. You know, we, we would stay up all there. It, 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 at the time of 2002, there were all these what they call board at work websites. OK, mm, yeah. Remember, uh, I know there's still college humor still exists, but back then it was just like this list, like a link, a list of links, college you know. humor, e-bombs world, things like that. Yes. E-bombs world, uh, tons of sites like that. And, you know, we were on these sites, you know, they might sound big now, college, these, these sites, but uh, they were willing to do these trades with us. So every time we did a trade, we'd get a couple hundred people checking out our show. And oh, if 10 great. of those people stuck around, it was 10 new listeners. Yeah, I mean, that that's really the way to do it. And I've said, you know, you could talk about SEO optimization all you want, and you could talk about Google search ranking all you want. But if you're not getting your name out there and you're not doing any kind of cross-promotion, it's going to be very difficult to tap into an audience. Sure. Uh, I, I spoke to someone early on, and his advice was take out Google ads. Take out Google AdSense ads yeah. and target it per location. I'm like, yeah, but nobody clicks on that. Who did you talk to that said that? Uh, it was it was a marketing guy. It was a yeah. it was a. It he was should a be company. fired from his job. Oh, he should be fired immediately. I think that's one of the worst pieces of advice anybody could give you. When but, somebody says take out Google Ads, they should literally mean with a rocket launcher. <laughs> <laughs> because seriously, nobody is reading Google Ads. No, no, nobody. It, it, it's it's a nuisance. You got to be a grandmother to be reading these ads. I don't even know if they, they even come up like they used to. I mean, I remember at one point it was all over the place, but... Our eyes are trained not to see them. I mean, I ask this question to people all the time. Tell me what's on that right-hand column on Facebook. Because I can't tell you, and I'm on that site every day. Nobody know knows. what's on there. Nobody My knows. eyes are trained not to look. And that's the way that we're doing it. I mean, it just... Yeah. 
I, I think something like that is an awful idea, but you pretty much relied on tapping into other people's audience and doing some sort of cross promotion sure. with their content and you picked it up. Do you, would you say it was that specifically that elevated the show to you know, where it is? But again, that was every day for a year doing cross promotion and targeting other sites that had an audience that I thought would like our show. You know, a lot of people try to just target everybody instead of targeting the people who are already interested in what you're doing. You know, first, until you fill up with everybody that already likes what you're doing that just doesn't know about you, you really don't have any business going after anybody else. Yeah. So, like, yeah. for me, people are like, hey, Mike, you should put up flyers and banners up on the city. No, I don't want to try to convince somebody who doesn't even know what a podcast is yet yeah. to listen to my show. I want to go after people who listen to podcasts and show them a better one to listen to first. So I always did that, you know, target the people who might be interested already and do that every day. So when you started, what what types of, I guess, podcast directories were there? What was helping you out? I know there was Different. Podcast Alley at the time, and that was pretty successful until iTunes came around. But uh, well, what was it? I think that was 2005 when all that started, right? With the podcasting or 2004? I think 2005, it was start, people started calling it a podcast. But this is what happened. I'll never forget the day. The news started coming out, and I was friends at that time. I was friends with a couple other internet radio shows. One of them was called Free Talk Live. I don't know if you've heard of them. I've never heard of them, actually. They were a libertarian internet radio show, but they happened to be syndicated on like 100 F FM and AM stations. Oh, they're now. still around, by the way. Yeah, they're still around. So they, uh, you know, we were, there were very little shows out there that did internet broadcasts, at least very little that I knew. And uh, we would talk back and forth. And he said, there's this thing called podcasting coming out. It took me about a year to understand what this was. OK, I was like, wait a minute. Is, is it you're able to listen to shows on your iPod? Does it do you have to buy a device that clips into the bottom that yeah. turns it into a radio? Is it how does it pick up? I didn't understand the syncing and the feed. I never understood yeah. what this RSS meant. And oh, so was, you weren't like doing said, that. You weren't doing an RSS when you started. You were just literally taking a show and just embedding it with a player on your website. Well, like I said, the idea of podcasting was not invented yet. Okay. You know, we, we were on for a year and a half, two years before this technology was even thought of by, I guess, uh, you know, whoever claims to have thought of it in the use of audio. RSS feeds have been around for a while, correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, pretty much every website has an RSS. Or something. But using it to subscribe to an MP3. Uh, that, that started when, you know, podcasting really became a thing. So when this came on, I, I was one of these people who was like, why would people do this? It seems like a lot of work when they could just go to our site and download the MP3. I didn't understand the subscription idea. Because podcasting, again, is a bad term. It was a bad way to explain what this is. It makes it seem like you're able to pick up signals from your iPod. At least back then, it, it that's what it sounded like. Yeah. Um, if you weren't a tech guy. No, and when I first started, I didn't really understand the importance of an RSS and all the subscriptions. I, I, I It's almost like the same thing. Um, they would have explained it like on-demand radio, subscription-based yeah. internet radio or something like that. Yeah, would, sure. Did iTunes I, change everything for you when iTunes came around? iTunes did. We were on this site, like you mentioned, called Podcast Alley. And at that time, there were only a couple hundred shows on there, okay? Yeah, because I remember when I started out, Podcast Alley was still kind of... Relevant? Yeah, yeah. I mean, people are still using it. I remember being ranked number one was a big deal there. It's um, a ghost town now. It's been, yeah. it's been uh, abandoned. But it was a podcast directory that also had a listener-infused uh, or a listener uh ran ranking system and what what you would do on podcast alley is all these shows could tell their listeners to vote for them every month and every month it was a race to see who can get into the top 10 and land a spot on the front page of podcast alley so we had our listeners do this we would say vote 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 at the beginning of every month vote for us on podcast alley and we would land in that top 10 range every month mm -hmm. we got a ton of listeners by doing that, because it was one of the only podcasts. This is before iTunes still. Uh, yeah, you were getting a front page feature on this website. That was the place to be for any any yes. podcast. So and, and still to this day, when I said, how did you find about the show? 
half of my audience heard of us from Podcast Alley. Oh, so it was amazing. a tremendous way to, to pick up listeners. So what happened is Apple, when they got into podcasting, they bought the directory from Podcast Alley. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know this was a uh, that they did this. That's how they started. They went to they said, what's the most successful place for podcasts? They went to Podcast Alley. They said, we're going to give you so and so amount of money for your directory. They took it. They put it on iTunes. And in turn, the iTunes uh, music store was already a big success at this point. OK, millions of people using the iTunes music store, using uh, using it to buy songs on their iPods. And then they launched podcasting. And now those millions of people are exposed to a couple hundred shows, including ours. Including no yours, yeah. No celebrity shows at this point. Yeah, All so underground you, internet guys like me. Who were who were the top comedy guys at that time when, when it went to iTunes? You were there, and, and how many other people would you say they, really had some sort of presence? They had shows in the comedy category, but you didn't have stand-up comedians doing podcasts. You had... The thing about podcasting was back then is it was very difficult to do and you had to be kind of a geek, a tech guy. You know, you had to be an audio guy to know how to do this stuff. So the people who were in podcasting weren't necessarily talented hosts. They were just people who could figure out the technology. So you had comedy podcasts back then, but they weren't using professional comedians. They were just people who might do a funnier version of a podcast. Yeah. So you know, pretty much it, it was like morning. It, it was like a comedy show on the radio, you know, like an Opie Anthony type show. No, 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 you did not have that. You had audio diaries. When podcasting first started, they were not emulating radio. Okay, They were doing a different. Ver it was a guy, usually a solo guy or a solo girl or the two of them combined talking into poorly calibrated audio equipment. And talking about their lives in long form with Very no production value. And that's what changed everything. You know, uh, I hated it and I still hate it. But that's what changed it because it was it was the first time when you could listen to something uninterrupted, long form and connect to somebody. And I couldn't understand this back then. I understand it very well now. But what podcasting did that radio didn't quite do is it developed a connection with the listener. So you didn't need the production value. You didn't need to take a break every six minutes and play all these crazy things and sound effects and whistles and bells and, and, and all these things that you heard on morning radio. You could just sit and talk. And it sure. didn't matter who you were or who your guests were. You could just talk. And there were shows that got huge by two regular people just talking to each other. I think I think it came down to and I think it still comes down to is if you're charismatic enough or you're interesting enough for that specific audience that that would be interested in listening to you to kind of stay uh, you, after that you, you're building the community and once you build the community they're here and it's a tapped in audience you're, you know sure. that they're going to be coming back to listen to you but they're also coming back because they're connected to everything that's going on with the show and outside of the show you know as far as the community sure. goes. You know, and back then, nobody thought of it that way. They just thought, hey, this is fun. I'm talking to a friend of mine in a microphone. We're recording it, and people are giving us feedback. At what you point know? do you do you realize that this is like a job now? You, you've created uh, a not not a living per se, but like this is something that you seriously want to pursue rather than just being like a hobby. You're talking about back then. At what uh, point, at what point do, you, do you get to this realization that this is happening? Um. Well, then much later on from then? No, yeah. it was. It was about a year after Apple launched their podcasting thing. And at this point, you know, we, we were really doing quite well for a podcast that was making no money. Um, we had a lot of listeners for who we were. Again, for who we were. It wasn't hundreds of thousands, but it was it was enough to impress our uh, and to impress us as kids. So um, there was a point where it was like. It was very tough to work a full-time job and come home and do an, an hour show every day and yeah. update the website and update the listeners and do all this types of stuff. Um, so there was a point where it was like, what am I going to do? I can't do both. And I love doing this podcast thing. But unless I quit my job, I'm not going to be able to turn the podcast into anything bigger. I can't dedicate any more time to it. Unless I quit my job. Now, is monetization, obviously, this is a big concern if you're going to be able to make a living off of this, right? 
So, well, yeah. And back then it was like, well, how do you make money off it? You got to sell ads. Sure. And it was, you know, well, how do you sell ads? Well, I guess I got to get on the phone or email people and see if they want to give us money to talk about their product. Nobody would. I mean, people did not know what a podcast was. They, uh, you know, it, it did not matter to them. Nobody I, would give you money to do this. And if they did, it was very little. And you'd have to almost trick them. And I do want know? to say it's still like that to an extent. I, I Many companies still don't understand why they would pay a show on the Internet to talk about their products. There's, there's, there's still only a handful of companies that are willing to advertise and understand the importance of advertising online or advertising with an Internet broadcast. Which is insane to me. It's crazy. I mean, uh, people uh, still think like, well, I'll pay a radio station thirty thousand dollars for a one month spot when when I'll probably get maybe fifteen people from this. When it comes to an internet radio station or internet broadcast, they're still like, well, no, nobody's watching anything on the internet. A dedicated listener who is actually paying attention to the full episode is worth twenty regular listeners that are just watching in the background. Oh, you're one hundred percent right. Or you know, breastfeeding their stupid kid while the commercials play. You know, going up to get a bottle. People are not sitting and watching commercials or listening to them in the radio. I'm I, I, in their car. They're not doing it. Nobody wants to listen to a commercial anymore. And I do want to say that the the level of commercials, the, the quality of these commercials that are on the radio now, are, are are not companies that I would ever buy anything from. No, I mean you, you have leaky roof or sump pump. Call us right now. Well, We're you know only what's worse. One hour of the week. What's worse is satellite radio ads. I mean, they're terrible. Do yeah. you want? Do you want to invest in gold? That's exact. I mean, that's every commercial. Are you kidding me? Well, that also Sh shows you watches. That shows you the level of, I guess, importance radio is for advertising. But again, a lot of these companies don't know. So you're. Let's go back to 2005, 2006. You're looking to monetize this. You're looking for ads. You have to literally cold call and email companies that yeah. have no clue what an internet broadcast is or, or a podcast. Luckily. And you know what? The other trick of this whole thing, if you're thinking, how can I do this at home? I was also, uh, me and my partner at the time, were very good at graphic design. So we made this beautiful ad kit, you know, a beautiful professional, like you would, like a radio station would have, a media kit. That sure. showed our demographic. You know, it was all lies, you know, but it would it would show our demographic, <laughs> what we can do for you, yeah. what kind of ads we could run. And when we showed all these people this stuff, it was hard to, you know, turn it down because it all looked very professional. Um, but again, you know, we're talking about getting a hundred bucks from a company, you know. Uh hundred dollars isn't isn't much a hundred dollars per show or a hundred dollars per week or month no, i mean it, it it all depended most likely a hundred dollars per month if yeah. you know selling ad spots for 15 bucks a piece yeah. selling ad spots for five ten dollars a piece um and the amount of work you have to do as a salesman to get those clients is not worth the money that you're getting back and plus it's like that wouldn't be enough money to pay you for your salesman job that you now just started. Oh, you're 100% right. Let alone right, yeah. the ad space you're actually giving them. So, I mean, it doesn't even pay back for the time you put in to uh, to go solicit. So uh, that's when we just stopped. We you just gave up stopped on that. doing it all together and focused on a different method of monetizing the show. Yeah, and you've been very successful at... Um and and I have to say, I give you so much credit for this because for someone that that does is not a a celebrity in the traditional sense of the word, has been able to monetize with donations and uh, special membership access. And I think you you also have you know merchandise. You have T-shirts and stuff like that, which I actually have a, a red bar shirt that I wore a couple weeks ago. Oh, thank you for buying. You know what? That was really sweet of you for buying that. You didn't have to do that. You could have asked me for one. No, no. I I when it comes to something I really you know like and believe in, I'll I'll support it. But um, you know, you, you have some great stuff there. How was that? How did that work? Because I'm always fascinated with the other end of this. Not really putting up ads. Uh, yeah. Not doing live reads because we do live read stuff. You know, we have our advertisers and we do our live reads and they really support the network and they pay for everything uh, that you see here. But how does that work when you have to go to your listeners and say, you know, hey, we're doing donations or, hey, if you want extra access to whatever sure. we did, 
here's the content, become a member. How did that work for you? Well, there are a couple of things that people are doing, and a lot of people have experimented with this, and nobody's quite found ultimate success in any of these methods. But what we did was we started a bonus content club, okay? And we charged $10 a month for exclusive videos, exclusive content, after shows, secret shows, song parodies, stuff like that, uh, archives of the show. And again, you know, you're lucky if you get 20 people to sign up for something like this. Sure. However, we took our bonus content club extremely seriously and put as much work into that as we would soliciting advertisers, okay? So all the time that we could have used to solicit and uh, try to try to sell ads, we put into this thing that we called the Barmy, which is our uh, bonus content club. And over the years, it took a very long time. But now we have enough members at ten dollars a month where we make a good living off of it now. Yeah, so you, you're giving access to, I guess, uh, the full shows in video and HD form. You're doing, uh, but yeah. before you did video, what, what was what, what did you give away originally? You did parody songs. You did well. There uh, was still videos on there. I mean, we would make our own videos. We would make songs, and like I said, when you've been doing the show since 2003, we have a ton of content. You know that people have. If you're a new listener of our show, we've got you know five thousand hours of backlog stuff. So this is available for everybody. We don't want to keep it all on the feed. Um, you know, it's just too much. And it, some of this stuff we don't want new listeners who don't really know about us even listening to. So uh, there's a ton of stuff on there. You know, for for ten years I've been sitting in front of a computer, fucking around making stuff. Yeah. And and it's and, it's, and by the way, I mean, you said something earlier that that we kind of skipped on the level of. A production that you're putting into the visuals of the graphics and the audio and even the video now. I mean, your your video is is tremendously uh, improved over uh, the last you. couple of years. Um, it, it's it's far ahead of what a lot of people are doing, and that really elevates the show. Into you know, you look at it, you're like, wow, this stands out for me. And that's what happened with me when I went on iTunes and I looked at the comedy podcast. I saw Red Bar Radio and I clicked on it because the graphics look nice. Thank yeah, see, and that's that's part of it too. Um, unfortunately, there are two million podcasts out there. There might be more. And it's very tough if you just are listening on audio alone, very tough for people to sample all that. So imagine it to be like a resume. If you're a boss and you've got a stack of resumes sitting there, let's say you got a hundred resumes on your desk for people trying out for the same job, and one of them is beautifully designed and in a nice folder. You're going to look at that one first, you know, compared to all the ones that are using Microsoft Word templates. No, So I right. always thought that that was very important. I needed everything to catch your eye. I needed it to be top of the line so that we could stand out in this gigantic herd of people doing awful podcasts. So currently uh, you would say that um, all, all the revenue coming into Red Bar is via donations and the bar me. Well, the Barmy is the big chunk of it. And then we have the online store that, that we release a new product almost every month on the store. So it's it's between the store and uh, and the Barmy, our bonus content section, that the revenue comes in. And that's what we're trying to build. So for every 100 listeners you pick up, you're hoping that at least five of them join the Barmy. So, and, uh, you know, that's what we're going to keep doing. We're not going to run ads on the show. You know, I hope that we don't. Uh, it's just, you know, and, and I, like I said, you you guys run ads, so we I'm do. not trying to say you're doing it wrong, you know. No, listen, it's, 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 it's so much work to get an ad. And I always tell people, people are like, well, how do you get an advertiser? And I always tell them, I'm like, before you get an advertiser, you start looking for it. You have to have a significant audience that will purchase this product. And uh, I, I said this on the air a couple months ago. We haven't, you know, we have Hover as an advertiser, but we've had other ads where I have turned down for certain months because I knew I couldn't fulfill whatever they expect from me. Sure. So I have to literally tell these companies, hey, listen, I'm not, I don't want your money because you're not going to be happy with me. 
and you're not going to resign. And that happens a lot. You burn bridges a lot in this business, especially with advertisers. A lot of people come in and one month they'll do phenomenal. And the other month, they really, they're not happy with the results and they don't understand why. Well, because the product that they're trying to sell is a very niche product. So yes. you have and to make what, sure. What advertisers don't understand is that it's not about selling the product. It's about the exposure for the product. Sure. And when the people need it, when the time comes, then their brand is in somebody's head. You're absolutely right. To, to me, advertising about is about, and the big giant companies understand this, is it's always it's not about, I mean, every time Coke puts up a giant billboard, they're not selling a Coke for every dollar that they spent. I mean, you know, for every person that sees it. What they're doing is reminding you about Coke. So when you're in the market for a cola, you're going to buy a Coke. Uh, the, advertising is about constantly keeping your brand on the on the customer's mind. It's not about selling a product every time. It's about when the time comes to sell the product, is your brand going to be the one that pops up in the person's head? And what podcast advertisers, the ones that are doing these giant, you know, where they're sending out, uh, you know, uh, money to all these different podcasts. Yeah, I think they're, they're affiliate to, programs, right? They call them affiliate programs. These affiliate programs, yes. What they, what they expect is they're rating success on how many people are buying their product using the offer code that you give out on your show. Yeah, which like, uh, we don't do any of those affiliate codes. And I think I think it's a great start for anybody that wants to learn how to do live reads and I tell them, I'm like, hey, listen, do, do, an, do a live read. If you want to learn radio and you want to get used to it, do a live read for an advertiser that's not giving you money. So you learn how to do it and you, and you kind of position yourself in a way that, okay, now I'm not, it's kind of not going to be an awkward transition when you're talking about a product from it's gonna sound silly doing a show. Uh, you kind of have to know how to do that. When, when we first started, we ran fake ads on our show. No, listen, it's not, it's not a crazy idea. We wanted to, you know what? Because like I said, we were trying to emulate what a radio show sounded like. And back then, radio shows had commercial breaks. So we would have a commercial break, and I would just run ads that I ripped from, <laughs> from the radio. From the radio. And listen, it's not, it's, not an, it's not a crazy thing to do. A lot of people need to learn how to do those transitions. Sure. Um, but when it comes to getting an advertiser, I don't do affiliate programs. I think it's useless most of the time, unless you have an audience like an Adam Carolla. You're never going to make a lot of money from an affiliate program, in my opinion. Yeah. I could be wrong. Listen, someone could turn around and say, listen, Andrew, I have a thousand people that listen to, listen to me, and every month they buy this product because of me. Unless it's something they're going to they're already buying. Like the Amazon click-through thing is good because if yeah. you're going to use Amazon, which a lot of people do, why not click through my click site? Through but you're asking stuff. a lot to, for somebody to do that. I would never do that. I'm yeah, not gonna, I, yeah. I use Amazon every day. I don't click through people's sites. I'm not going to do that. So you you're still doing the uh, Barmy stuff. I I want to I want to touch on a couple of things now. Um, and, and if you don't want to talk about it, don't talk about it. But I've noticed that you have become the standard for a lot of people when it comes to your style of comedy. And I've literally seen people that do Red Bar Radio without being Red Bar Radio. How does that affect you? I mean, do, do you just go crazy when that happens? I used to hate it a lot more, and then I stopped hating it. And now I hate it a lot more again. Okay. Um, there's something, and, and especially, again, I keep going back to this point where it's to do this, to do what I'm doing, to, to make my show, my one show. It's not like I have a network of shows that is for the mainstream. I'm doing a show that odds are 80% chance when you listen to it, you will not like it. Why, why do so, you say that? Because of the content? Because of the content? It's not forever. You have to have this sense of humor to like this yeah. show. Most regular people will not like the show. In fact, I have, you know, it, it, it takes a long time for people to realize you're not special. The fact that people like your show is a gift. You need to appreciate that. And not go, I can't believe people don't like my show. Why should they like your did show? Did that affect you in any way when people did not like your show? Uh, because I would imagine, you know, you're doing it because this is the type of show you want to do. And then it you get that email. Me. It only affected me back in the day if they didn't like my show, but they liked another show that I knew in my heart was a piece of crap. Yeah. Okay. So it wasn't about them not liking my show, but it was about what do you like? So if they didn't like my show, but they like, you know, waking up with Whoopi, mm -hmm. uh, Whoopi Goldberg, 
uh, then I get mad because it's like, OK, well, you're you know, you got to get your priority. If you don't like my show and, um, you know, the shows you do like are, uh, you know, Breaking Bad on AMC. Yeah, I get that. But if you if you don't like my show, but you like uh, I'm trying to give an example of a really terrible podcast, but I don't know if people would know them. Uh, anyway, but I got over that. And now it's like I even have like a clip on my YouTube where it's like, uh, I expect you not to like the show. And if you do, that's fantastic. Um, but, um, yeah, I go into it. But you thinking. see that you have the advantage of doing one type of show five yeah. days or four days a week. What we do here, and this has been a kind of a battle for us. And, and I think we spoke off air about this. I, do, you know, we have 10 shows and every one of the shows targets a different audience. Yeah. And I have had to kind of recondition a lot of the viewers into understanding that if you don't like this show that I'm doing, you have another show that you could watch. If you watch Leno, if you hate Leno, sure, it's you like despise MBC's Leno. Lineup. You despise Leno. You don't turn off NBC and say, I'm never watching another NBC show. You turn on no. Law and Order. You turn on uh, Jimmy Kimmel and you're like, OK, I like this guy. You have yeah. to understand that. It, it's, you, yeah, if you like 30 Rock, we don't expect you to have to like Ellen. Yeah, it, 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 there's a there's a when it's a network. And this is what I've tried to do. I want it. I want every one of my shows to sound a little different than the other one. I do a tech show and it's this straight man, you know, tech show. And then I do, you know, my show and it, it's kind of like what you do with with the content. It, people, their heads explode at times because they, they think that this one side of me represents who I am, uh, and they listen to this, I'm like, oh, I don't like this. I don't like what he's saying. I don't uh, like the content he's talking about. When you're doing, when you have a network and all the shows are different, and you're 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 bringing them to one website, and the thing too, like I've noticed, when you go to the Bald Truths website and watch the show, when his show is over, his player will play one of the other shows on the network, correct? Uh, yeah, at times we've done that because we do a show on Fridays. So yeah, sure. at times it, so it goes yeah, to that. You're going to have an audience who did not ask to see one of these shows who, have, yeah. who sees it. And you they, know? So that's where you're going to get those crossovers where they're like, what is this? But I think a lot of people have changed their tone. I, I think a lot of people are exposed to different types. There's so much content out there now. I, I don't think unless you're really hardcore about your values in some way, I don't think that is as prevalent of an issue than it used to be i think now we kind of understand and we kind of listen it's the freedom of speech you're able to do the show if i don't like red bar and I've, i'm offended by something uh, a i could just turn it off uh and and not watch it or b i could just turn on something else that i want to watch i don't i'm not forced to watch your program and I, and i've, I've been amazed that i by learned that. early on and this adapts to this this dilemma here um, you cannot assume that somebody has the same brain in their head that you do, Andrew, yeah. because they don't. So that that's how you think. But believe me, 90% of the world, you know how they think? Hey, what should I get for dinner tonight? Domino's sounds good. Yeah. Maybe I'll go to McDonald's for lunch. Hey, what do I want to be for, uh, for uh, when I grow up? I think I'll work at the post office. That's how people think. So they don't get it. And, and unfortunately, I think that's 90 percent of the world who does not get what's going on. You so know, you're, they're out of touch. They're out of their fucking mind. As you've said, yeah, a lot of people wouldn't you know, you expect people not to like it. it. Have you given up on that idea? When did you give up on that idea that maybe or maybe you never had it? Maybe my show will be on the radio. Uh, we always wanted to be on the radio. We were on the radio. We got we were the first podcast to become syndicated. Uh from just being a podcast, never being on the radio before, to jumping on actual radio. Mm -hmm. This was back in, uh, I don't even remember the dates. But we were, we were picked up by a uh, syndication company called GCN. And we were, we were syndicated on a couple different AM radio stations. And it was the worst time, time of my life. Why, I mean, why, why was it? Because you couldn't do the content you wanted to do. You can't do the content. You know, everybody has this dream that you are going to get picked up and become Howard Stern or Opie and Anthony. What you don't realize is these guys, the only reason these guys are able to do any of this stuff is because the fans overpower the people that they work for. And even in that case, the, the powers that be still still get to have way too much control. So when you're when you're a podcast uh, that that doesn't have this gigantic fan base, you can't do anything. You're taking a break every six minutes. You can't 
curse. Yeah. You can't you can't do any of this stuff. And you you also can't it's not just about cursing, but they have this weird, weird thing called pandering where you can't talk about certain subjects, whether they be too political, whether they be uh, too convincing in an opposing direction to your advertisers beliefs or to the affiliate stations beliefs. It becomes very political. And the more affiliate stations you have and the more people you work with, the more people that you're sharing revenue with, the more rules you have to place on your show. And eventually you just become a talking head for some product. You have yeah. no voice anymore because you're thinking about a hundred different voices in what they want instead of what does my voice want. And we to also say. have to remember that Howard Stern and Opie and Anthony and Mancow and, and Bubba, you know, these guys came into a time uh, broadcast we're broadcasting at a time where you the internet did not exist to the level that it yeah. does now. The it content, the content, the first time Howard would say a word like anal was shocking to people. Now you you go to any website, you go to a a, a clean cut website and they're talking about it. Uh, the the perception of what is taboo has kind of sure. changed over the last 15, 20 years in broadcasting. Yeah, uh, you can't, you know, Howard Stern jumped on the air and just said a couple shocking words and all of a sudden he had... A million people tuning in. Yeah, because every media picked it up. Now you could get that on on any number of websites that you go on. So you really have to deliver something. The days of a Howard or days of like an Opie and Anthony are, are gone at this point, and that's what's Completely really gone. screwed up radio. I mean, there's no New York. You'd be very some New York does not have a morning drive time guy other than the morning zoo. We I th don't Opie have and Anthony on? no Opie and Anthony have been off of New York radio for a couple oh, of years oh. now. All right. Yeah, I haven't been. I gave up on that whole thing. I don't like it. I can't follow it. Uh, there's no reason to listen to terrestrial radio anymore. There just isn't. You know, unless you're poor and all you have is a Chevy uh, Caprice with a radio dial in it, and you're on the road constantly looking for a place to crash. So you, you did know? the radio thing for how long? Say that again. How long were you guys on terrestrial we're on radio? For about six months before we got fired. And what What did you get fired for? For swearing. Oh, you, okay. We, we didn't have a dump button. We couldn't afford it, uh, which is the uh, delay. So when you curse on the uh, terrestrial radio, they'll hit a dump button where it, it, it stops the, the real-time broadcast and uh, gives a little time in between so the people actually listening don't actually hear the curse words. We couldn't afford that. We couldn't afford the operator to operate stuff like that. Yeah. So after about the seventh time we cursed, you know, the network just said, you know, we can't risk this. We're, yeah. we're going to lose all our affiliates. So at this point now, the only other broadcasting method other than, you know, podcasting and what you're doing is satellite radio. And, and you tried that and that didn't work out that great either. And we were on there, too. Again, unless you're getting the dream deal, which does not happen in radio anymore, which does not happen unless you're all, unless you're Oprah or Howard Stern, it, it's not worth it. I mean, you know, maybe it can be, but the deal we got definitely wasn't the dream deal. The deal we got was we're going to put you on. We're not going to pay you. And uh, you're going to do an hour long show and you could say whatever you want, but you can't. OK. Yeah. And here was the thing. When they say you can say whatever you want, they're still listen, Sirius and XM and all th these companies are giant companies. They have agendas. Their agenda isn't. Who's the most creative in talk radio? Let's entertain people. Their agenda is let's make a billion dollars. So they don't want something that they might think is controversial. They want something that's safe, that people are going to listen to. They don't have to love it. They just have to listen to it. And I don't even think they care about listeners. I, there's something else going on with that Sirius XM. They're doing they're not a broadcasting company. They're doing something else. Really? I think so. I don't think they're about broadcasting. There's something. And if people, I'm sure the research is on there a lot. The, it's like, um, you know, President Bush wasn't a president. He was a businessman. Yeah. It's like that. Well, what's you know? fascinating to me about satellite radio is, and, you know, I grew up a fan of radio. And uh, I would I would listen to my, my, my uncle would send me tapes of Phil Hendry yeah. growing up. Like, I was a, I grew up a huge fan of radio. But I sure. never really wanted to emulate radio. I never looked at it as a career move for me. This is yeah. something that I stumbled upon when I got laid off from my job and I was sitting here drinking all day. You know, like I kind of fell into this podcasting thing and I enjoy doing it. But I still don't see it as reg like radio. I'm not doing a radio voice. I'm not doing a, a morning course. drive time show. And I never would want to. But yeah. uh, when I grew up, I was a fan of radio. 
And when satellite radio came on board, I was one of those guys like, wow, we're going to get such good content now. We're going to get, you know, uncensored content. And all these guys in all these markets that we've never heard of now have a shot at being heard. I could have access to all these great shows. And it was nothing like that. You know, Howard went and that was the hope that Howard would go and he would build a channel. Nothing happened with that. Nobody's on there. You have no personalities. They're not building any talent. So what are they doing? They're signing up people like Jamie Foxx and Oprah Winfrey to these multi-million dollar contracts. And you know what? Howard is the exception. He deserves it. He's been, he's revolutionized radio, whatever you want to say about him. But he even got this sweetheart deal. And everybody else, I could tell you, I know producers for top shows at Sirius. And they're getting paid minimum wage. Yeah. They are executive producers for huge shows and they're getting paid about $30,000 a year. That is a problem. Working for rate and people romanticize about this, you know, maybe not the common people, but I know people in podcasting who think radio is the dream job. Once you turn your art into a job, it is no longer your art. It becomes a daily job. So it's the same thing as like a lot of people want to be artists, but do you necessarily want to just be uh, working for McDonald's doing graphic design? It's not the same thing. So when you're when you yeah, I would love to have the audience that FM radio can provide for me. But do I want to work in that industry? Absolutely not. And I've worked in that industry. I've been on satellite radio. I've talked to these people. uh, I know these people and they're not in it for the same reasons I'm in it. They're in it to make money. I'm in it to uh, to because I love it. I love doing it. But I mean, you're able to make a living. You're able to live off of I'm able to. this. That that is, you know, and the only reason that the monetization even comes into play is just because it has to. I can't just do it uh, without making money because we have to pay bills. Sure. I, but, and listen, um, uh, and I'm looking at your set. I mean, it's an amazing, amazing setup. And you you just redid uh, the video, and you got new systems. I mean, this is an expensive. Yeah. Said it's not like, oh, well, Mike just happened to have a TV and a compressor and a and a, you know, three grand mixer and a great mic. And he's just happening to do this for free. It's an it's a constant expense expense. And you constantly have to change your equipment. Sure. I mean, you just uh, you just went to high def. And we that was a big high def, and we're upping it again. I mean, uh, today I've got another new microphone coming in that I don't even need. I just, you know, wanted it. I'm upgrading the mics. We're updating the set today, later today. Um, and, uh, it's constant, but you know what? I, I have to do that. You know, the, the minute you start getting comfortable and the minute it starts becoming easy is the minute that your show starts to stink. Yeah. So you got to yeah. constantly keep challenging yourself, whether it's by upping the production, whether it's by upping the content, whether it's by challenging yourself in other areas. But I mean, that's the way I work. The minute I start going, Oh, I'm comfortable here. I have to make it hard for myself again. So where would you where do you want to take Red Bar? Where, what is the the goal now? I mean, you you've kind of hit every major goal there is when it comes to this. I mean, you have a great yeah. audience. You no, have you never hit your goal when you're one of these psychotic people like myself. You, yeah, you never yeah, hit goals. You also never really make goals. You don't know what you want, and are most you, people don't know what they want. Are you unhappy with the shows you do? Do you listen back and like oh, I I didn't like the show? No. Are you one of those? You can't be unhappy with it. You know, it is what it is. And at the end of the day, the people aren't listening because of certain content. They're listening because of what I do with that content. And some days I'm not going to be awesome. And you just have to realize that, you know, you're doing a show five days a week, unscripted, two hours each time, no budget. There isn't a team of writers. And that's that's the kind of show it is. So some days it's just going to be me talking about how mad I am. Some days it's going to be me, uh, you know, being hilarious. But and I mean, th- you've incre- you've had a lot of ups and downs. Uh, recently, you had an issue with it, and then you revived Red Bar. I mean, things like that happen, and that has to be. And, and this goes back to you know the same aspect of you have to sit at home and sell ads, and then you got to do a two three hour show right after that. It kind of sucks the energy out of you. It does. So you know, my goal, if you want to look at my goal, it's it's basically to never have to what I call look at the clock. OK, and let me explain what that means. Any person who has a job that they don't like, they do this thing where they look at that clock on the wall and it says 3 p.m. And then an hour later, they look at it again and it says 3:15, and they go, I thought this was an hour later. 
When is this day going to end? Now, if you do that, you're not doing your life right. If you're looking at a clock waiting for your day to end, you're not doing something right because you should be looking at the clock going, oh, fuck, I don't want the day to end. I, I want to keep this day going. Why would you want things to end? Sure. Why would you want to fast forward through your life sitting at a desk? So my goal is to be able to not look at that clock, to never have anybody tell me that my day is going to be miserable, to be able to wake up whenever I want, to be able to. And you know what? If the show completely changes, that's what it's going to do. I'm not going to lock myself into something because maybe I'm not going to enjoy this type of show next year. So you got to keep doing what you enjoy. And hopefully people can connect to that. Hopefully you can make enough money to survive off of that. But it really isn't about striking gold. It's about how to make every day just uh, an awesome day. No, absolutely. Um, any any tips you could give any kind of uh, anybody getting into podcasting yeah. or anybody that's been doing this? What do you what do you tell them when when you get those emails like, hey, Mike, I want to get into podcasting. What should I do? Usually I tell them to find a brick and bash their head open with it. You know, <laughs> uh, I don't want people to get into podcasting ever, ever. Get out of my it. fucking industry. Seriously. No, um, I would say do it, but don't have a plan. Don't ask me how to make money. I, I see these guys, they'll start a podcast and day two, they're asking how they can get sponsors and how they can make yeah, money. That, see, that's how the about, wrong reason. Enjoy it. Enjoy it for a second. See if this is even what you like. And that's exactly what I tell people. The market, don't, don't, if you're going into podcasts as your make it rich quick scheme, you're, you're out of your mind. And don't flood my market with your crap where you're trying to make $300 a year off. Yeah. You know, it really is ridiculous. Go I, into it because this is what you're meant to do. When I always Go. tell people, Mike, I tell them, you know, the money will come if you build that audience. They're going to come to you. you don't don't it, start out looking for ads. You know, I, I got guys that have been doing this for six months. And they say, well, well, how can I get an ad? And I tell them, I'm like, don't look for an ad. Work on the content, work on the show, build the audience. And build once audience. you build an audience, the ads are going to come to you. They're going to start approaching you saying, hey, listen, we like your show. We want to advertise with you. That's when you know you could get an ad. You can start looking for ads. D don't, it, don't make the ads the main thing because that will ruin it for you. You got to think of your audience as your muscle. So the more muscle you build, the more things you'll be able to lift. The more power you're going to, the more people you have listening to it, the more you can do with it. And the more doors, uh, you're able to unlock more doors with the more people you have listening. So all you have to do to have a successful podcast is every day try to get more listeners. And that's all you have to worry about. And then when you have a ton of listeners, you could lift that car because you're strong. So uh, that's all you got to do. Don't try to sell ads. Don't try to make a living off of it at first. Get good at it. And once you have a thousand people, that love your show, then you have the right to start selling ads. No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right with that. But uh, if you if you can't if you don't have a thousand people that love your show, you know then then you're just doing it for yourself right now. Yeah, listen, it, it, it's a fun thing. I enjoy doing it. I, I enjoy listen. Some of my shows they have a great audience. Some don't have a big enough audience, like like uh, like the tech show or something else. But I enjoy doing a show. I'm doing it because I I like it. I'm not doing it because I'm be I'm making money off of the Chauncey Hayden show. No, uh, you know, like I said, you know, we did it. We've been doing it for 10 years because we like it, uh, not because it's a moneymaker. You know, I, I I can pick up a graphic design job and make more money than I'm making at this. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's not about the money. But if you can do it and live off of it, then you're rich. Then you've made it. That that to me is making it to be able to not have a boss, do whatever you want and not be struggling is making it. So now you uh, you updated your cameras. You're in high def. Uh, you're you're getting a new new microphone. Are you looking to build in the the Red Bar brand further? Are you looking to add more shows in the future? What are you looking to do with it? I think my plan with it, from what I and, and again, I've tried these things. I've learned from mistakes. And this time around, you know, we kind of relaunched the show back in October of this year. This time around, I've taken every mistake that I've learned from. And I kind of relaunched the show doing things the right way. So I've gotten rid of all that crap that I've tried that might half work or might not work at all. And I've gotten rid of it. And I'm just doing the stuff that I know works for us. And I, I'm just focusing 
on 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 the one thing now. We're just going to build the audience. We're going to do the show we like to do, and that's going to be about it. Now, if another, it, 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 when it's time to expand to do something, I'll I'll kind of know. I'll kind of feel that, you know. Um, but you know, you start spreading yourself too thin. And you're not going to really have the quality product that you want, I don't think. No, you're absolutely right with that. Uh, when a couple, I think it was like two years ago, I started doing uh, my show twice a week, and I was doing it for another network. Uh, Leslie Gold had a, uh, a webcast network that uh, they ended up shutting it down, but I was doing two shows a week of the same material, and I was just watering it down, so I just stopped doing it. Just I, I wasn't enjoying it. Yeah, so you're you gotta right keep it enjoyable, and like I said, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna focus it all on our show this time. Yeah, I've gotten offers from other shows like we should combine efforts, we should work together and do this. And it's like it's not gonna work out. I know it's not gonna work out. I've done this before. You know, you're gonna have your interest. I'm gonna have mine. Let's stop pretending that you know everybody could share and be friendly. So it's yeah. just gonna be about our interest and our fans interest and kind of keep it our own little thing. And I think that's what our fans respond to. They want it to be their own thing. They don't really want us to be on a big network. They don't want us to be mainstream. They kind of like it like this. And as long, listen, as long as you're happy with it, that's what matters, right? I mean, you want it to be in that direction. That's where you're going to take it. Sure. And, and you know what? You really got to think, do you love what you're doing? Or do you want to do what somebody else is doing? And a lot of people just have this fantasy. I want to be the biggest show. I want people to respect me. Well, do you know why you want that? I mean, have you thought about it? Do you really know what you're looking for? Is it really the money? Is it uh, the fame? Do you really know? You know, and after 10 years, you kind of get an idea of what has made me happy. I've gotten some big checks in my day. But you know what? I, 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 I've gotten uh, listeners that got red bar tattoos that made me happier than a big check. I've had listeners that have made drawings for us yeah. that made me happier than a big check has made me uh, feel. Because you've so, connected, you've made, you know, not that you made it, but these people, uh, your viewers are now so involved with, they're taking the time and they're building this for you. You know, they're, they're helping you with this or they're sending really you are, something. You know, a lot of them are part of the show. They're part of the creation of the show. They're part of the way the show works. And uh, you can't, you can't just have... Um, you can't buy that. You, a network can't give that to you. No, you're absolutely right. So, uh, and it is different. People aren't going to, this isn't going to be the plan for everybody. It just happens to be what I fell into here. So there's no way to do it. But I really do think it, it starts from the passion. If you don't have the passion for it, it's not going to work. Red Bar Radio show uh, every day, right? Every day, every weekday. Yeah. Every weekday, uh, four o'clock central. Yeah, around there. Around we kind of switch it around. You know, the podcast is available all the time, but uh, live usually 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. You could catch us live. A three-hour show. Uh, I lo Listen, I listen, you know, I don't catch the live show because sometimes I'm on, but I, I put on yeah. the podcast. Uh, you know, I subscribe on iTunes and I listen to it. Uh, it's amazing what you've built. Uh, it just shows that with enough of an audience, enough of effort and uh, good content, you could really build an entertaining show that's successful on the internet and that people are going to listen to day in and day out. I mean, that that's the amazing thing about this. And you're not a celebrity. I mean, to some extent now, yeah, because of the internet, but you didn't come from this past where, you know, you were on the radio, you were on TV, you were in a movie, uh, you're a comic. You've, you started off just Joe Schmo and now you've built, you know, the brand and you're, you're very successful at it. So I give you uh, all the credit in the world for that. And it's, it's well, I'm glad that that's how it appears. I'm really, yeah. you know, it's yeah. thank you for saying that because um, that's really nice to hear. And listen, I understand it takes so much work. And I always tell people, I'm like, there's so much stuff that goes on with building a brand without any kind of, you know, massive PR or massive marketing. You really have to, it comes down to one thing and that's content. You yeah. really have to put out good content. If you're putting out crappy content, people are not going to watch it. And that is and the reason why they're not watching it. You know, it's like those people who go out and try to make a YouTube viral video. You can't try to make this stuff. You can't attempt to make something that's going to be popular. You just have to keep doing something that you like doing every day. And hopefully somebody likes it. You yeah. know, when they made I, I just watched this South Park documentary the other night. 
when they made that pilot episode, they weren't like, we need a hit show. We need to make something that the people are going to like. They made something that they liked. Yeah, and it worked out for them. responded to it. Yeah, and, and that's why, you know, what's interesting. There have been many shows that are kind of like South Park, and they fail. Why do yeah, they fail? Because they're missing whatever the original had. Yeah. In, in any form of, of you know, this, this art stuff, whether it's art, whether it's music, whether it's comedy, whether you're doing a podcast, you have to do the show or the art that you like doing and then get better at your style of thing. Don't do what you think people are going to like. Don't do what somebody else is doing. Because if it's not coming from you, if it's not your thing, no one's going to respond to it. People see right through it. They don't even know that they're seeing through it, but they do. Yeah. Uh, check out Red Bar Radio, redbarradio.net. Mike, I want to thank you for coming on, man. Hey, thanks for really having me. It. I'd love to uh, do it again where we don't have to talk all about me. No, no. no we'll, we'll do it again sometime, whenever you want to do it. Because, uh, you know, I told you, I, I, I really love the product that you put out. I think it's hilarious, and I, and I you know, I'm a fan of it. So Can uh, I say I something it. real sure. quick? And I want to thank you. Because I've met a lot of people in this kind of industry, and you, you're you a very busy person. You're doing a million things at once, and I know better than anybody how much you're doing just because I could see the work that comes out of it. And the fact that you take your time out of the day to kind of help me with things, who I'm a, I'm a stranger to you, basically. Um, the fact that you took your time out and helped me uh, with a couple of tech things and, you know, to have me on your show, you know, it uh, it does mean a lot. No, you know, I appreciate it, man. You. No, listen, I've always said uh, when I first started off doing this, I had a guy that was pretty known uh, send me an email. I sent him an email. I'm like, hey, you know, I'm getting into this. I, I have somewhat of an audience. Uh, just want a tip because you've been pretty successful at this. And they pretty much told me to fuck off. Yeah. So after that, I said I would never do that to anybody. And if I could, I could to help anybody. anybody Anybody? No, I'll do it to some people. I'll do it to I, some people. Yeah, some people I'll talk the fuck <laughs> off, but I won't do it to most. You know, and and I, you know, I, I turned on your show, and I, I forgot how we linked up. I sent you an email or something, and you know, I, you know, you asked me a couple questions. I'm like, yeah, dude, I'll help you out. Whatever you need, it, it's what is it going to do to me? It, and we shouldn't look at this as competition. And this is a a screwed up mindset that a lot of podcasters have is that they look at another show and they get angry that that show is successful or that show has. Uh, better production than them uh -huh. we have to kind of look at it as like wow this guy's doing pretty good let me ask him you know what how do how can sure. i do that the I, way i do it i look at it and it, if uh if i look at a show that i think is doing it better than me then i i it, it just makes me want to do it better than them yeah sure and i mean it's I do. it encourages you to do well i want to be kept on my toes if you know, you went HD, and, and now I'm like, you know what? Maybe I should go into yeah. high def. Maybe I should start doing the HD video. Exactly, and you know what? The minute somebody, I see these other shows now, they're putting, and it's not like I'm the first person who did it, but when I see another podcast put a TV in the background, it's like, well, now I have to up it again. I'm going to do more. Yeah, you sure. I, that That's just how it is. So we really shouldn't look at it like that, and that's why, you know, uh, this is being recorded for the IIB, and this is the point of the organization where we're trying to introduce everybody to each other you know there are people that might not know red bar ready but now they're going to see this they're going to be like wow this guy's doing an amazing job i either a want to tune into him or, or you know get in touch with him to see what he's been up to because it's really amazing what you built mike and it, i just want to say it again uh i'm a big fan of it and uh i wish you all the success in the world and uh i want if one thing i could request from you is a three-hour candy man show uh, we will be doing the three-hour Candyman hour with Tony Todd himself, the black guy who played Candyman. He uh, will be here. If that happens, I cannot see why Network will not pick you up. Well, this is very exciting. I can't wait to be on NBC with Whitney. It, it, that's that's great. You'll be you'll be following Whitney, and it'll be the Candyman hour with uh, this <laughs> weekend Candyman. People will love it. <laughs> All right, Mike. Uh, I want to once again remind everybody: go to RedBarRadio.net. Check out Mike's. Uh, amazing, amazing comedy podcast. Uh, you could also subscribe on iTunes and everywhere else that uh, you can pretty much get podcasting. This show will be uh, on our website at gfqnetwork.com. It'll also be on the IIB, ibroadcastnetwork.org. If you are a podcaster, live broadcaster, webcaster, whatever you want to call it, this is the organization. We are a centralized hub for all things internet broadcasting. It will also have this on iTunes and uh, Stitcher and Zoom and everybody everywhere else you can imagine. Uh, until next time, uh, see you all later and um, watch Candyman.